Hi, may I speak with John Tritsky, please? Perfect. Hi, it's, where am I reaching you? Originally in Chester, England. Oh, Who's very. Calling? It's Mar sir, it's Mark Larry Young from Real West. Oh, hi, Mark. How are you doing? Okay. I had a little bit of trouble dialing out, but uh, now that I've got you, all is good. I'm surprised you're you're getting me. Actually, we were just on my way to my sister-in-law's to get near a land phone because the reception isn't very good often, which is why I recommended you use a land phone number. But oh, this okay. this was the only number that I was given. This was the only number I could find. Really? Well, well anyway, uh, carry on if, you want, if you're ready to talk. I'm ready to talk. Perfect. Can you tell me what it was like to be on the, on the flip side of a documentary camera? Well, it's a very, you know, strange experience because I've always avoided, you know, being on camera in any of my films. So I've have been known to make the odd Alfred Hitchcock cameo one shot or so of me, but I really uh, always thought I was not suited to be on camera, and as a result, stayed off. So it was like after almost 50 years in the business, a very, very strange experience to find the shoe on the other foot as it how did, how were you, do you remember how you were approached and how you were convinced? Uh, well, Michael Savoy, who has shot a number of my films over the years, he and his producer, Chen, came out to Vancouver and took me out for dinner, wine and dined me, and I said, no, I wouldn't consider it under any circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and, but Michael is a very determined kind of guy, so he left me alone for, because I was busy at the time uh, doing another film. And uh, he was smart enough to leave me alone while I finished the film on eccentrics that I was doing. And then... I mean, I don't think the second time he didn't come out solely to see me. He was also on business, other business. But in any event, he called me up again. And uh, again, we went out for dinner. And uh, yeah, I thought, well, maybe I should. Do you, do you remember where he wined and dined you in Vancouver? Okay. <laughs> Where where's home oh, for you? Spent a lot of money. You can you can rack up a bill in there. Where's home for you in Vancouver? Right now? Yeah. I don't live in Vancouver. Uh, we we're just vagabonds now. No fixed address. Okay. Um. No. We're traveling. We're traveling for a year and living in different parts of Europe for different periods of time. Uh, we're not just touring. I don't believe in that. We are as my wife. And so they like to go to places and rent an apartment and learn about a neighborhood, get to know local people. And uh, yeah. What so we were in Sicily for six weeks in a great town near Palermo, and then we spent two months in Amsterdam, which is my all-time favorite city in the world. And I've lived there several times, and my wife's lived there a couple of times, too. And now we're at Chester, England, until mid-January. Uh, she's from the Chester area, trained as a nurse. Uh, here in Chester, and uh, so it's home week for her. 
and then mid January, uh, we're still trying to figure out where we might go next. We're considering Rome, we're considering Barcelona, even Morocco is energy to that, you know, discussions. <laughs> are you breaking out of, are you breaking out a camera at all? No, I don't have a camera with me. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing retirement. Okay. Are you any good at it? Oh, I'm enjoying it immensely. I, I don't have enough hours in the day uh, to do all the things that I would do if I were retired. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Mm -hmm. So I uh, watch it. I'm on a diet every day. I watch at least one. Usually two, maybe three documentaries. So I'm catching up on a lot of documentaries that I uh, haven't seen. Uh, I spent a lot of time reading and cruising the internet, uh, listening to a lot of music. Currently spending at least an hour a day listening, listening to the Nobel prize winner, Bob Dylan, and uh, Hanukkah, you know, you know, crosswords, uh, endless, endless. No. And then junk television, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, you were saying you get like five great ideas a day. That's kind of awesome. What makes an idea great to you? What makes an idea great for me? Yeah. Well, I have to sort of feel there's some uh, social reason or some good reason to be doing any film unless I think it's worth doing. It can be a great idea, but if there isn't, you know, as I say, some social purpose attached to it, then I usually don't do it. Where does that... I get, I get like, I get three ideas a day. It's not getting ideas, it's getting uh, a bureaucratic machine to finance these things, you know? Okay. But can you talk? I say without bitterness in my voice. <laughs> can... it, it actually anyway. really disturbs me that you would have trouble getting something financed. Oh, it's a, yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, in Canada. It's a world run by bureaucrats, and uh, it doesn't matter what your experience, what your track record is, you're forced to jump through the same hoops as the rookies. And in a way, I think that's fair, because the rookies should have the same chance as everybody else. But I'm not too appreciative of the fact that I have to jump through those hoops. Uh, I sort of figured once you'd been declared an icon, you no longer had to jump through quite the same hoops. So that's kind of disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody assumes that, Mark, but I can assure you, they still like to put the bar in front of you and you have to ask how high, you know? Wow. Yeah. Still have to do all the paperwork and the treatments and all that nonsense because... Especially in documentaries, if it's true documentary, how can you, we're not doing feature movies, we don't have scripts, we can't, you know, say, oh, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. It doesn't matter how thorough you do your research or how, you know, if you do have the money to do a scout, it's still, once the cameras roll, it's, you know, it's a crapshoot, so. But meanwhile, there's bureaucrats, as I say, and armies of bureaucrats who study these documents and treat them like they're feature movie scripts. You know. 
Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I get that, having been trying to find a documentary for two years. Well, there you go, you know. Yeah, and that's common. So what's taking you two years? You've been ready to do the film for oh, two no, years. Oh, like no, we've been shooting it. We, we just need to be able to afford archival footage and CBC and uh -huh. NFB are horrible on it. Yeah, don't get me going there. <laughs> so I, I was honestly really shocked. I thought, well, I found... Uh, in the case of the NFB, I found footage they had lost and they still wouldn't cut me a break on it. No, no. My latest film, which is the third film I've done for CBC over close to 30 years now. Uh, I had stock footage of, that I paid for. It was in the first film. And then I used the same stock footage again in the second film. And again, they charged me. They're, they would, you know, even though it was CBC production, and now I've done a third film, and no, there's no deal, whatever. You pay the same rates, even if you already paid for the footage twice. Oh, okay. No, yeah. That, that's horrible. <laughs> yes, it is. I, I had actually thought that if you were doing, like, I thought maybe if we sold to CBC, which we keep trying, that you got the CBC stuff as part of the deal. Well, maybe you can make it part of the deal, mm -hmm. but it wasn't part of my deal with, with the CBC. And they, even though we were having financial problems and were over budget and approached them, and no, nothing, no. Pay what you pay, what we charge, $77 a second. Yep. That's the yep. number that's stopping my movie right now. Yes. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm deeply sympathetic. <laughs> Trust me. Wow. Um, can you talk about where your passion for social issues comes from? newspaper business and worked for a number of papers including the Globe and Mail and I've always sort of been a guy who cheers for the underdog whether it's sports or politics or whatever you know I mean yeah I guess that's not a very good explanation but yeah well what what about something like the thalidomide story, which you've really, you know, you've clearly taken a a, a passion, you've, you've clearly shown yeah. such a passion for that. Yeah, well, that's a perfect example. I mean, you know, I made the first film because the Canadian government had put their promises to the thalidomide victims and their families that they would be compensated properly and then needs would be looked after and I'm not just saying solely as a result of that film but in part the government responded and finally they got you know what they deserved to get and uh, that's what's you know motivated me throughout now had you covered these sorts of issues when you were in newspapers like can you talk a little bit about the switch yeah, I was a I was an investigative reporter uh, in, in the newspaper business. I won a national newspaper award, the Globe and Mail, and I uh, am proud to say I got two Ontario cabinet ministers to resign as a result of stories I did on their conflicts of interest, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Created a lot of I was a troublemaker. My father said it early on, you know. He said, you know why you're a real shit disturber. <laughs> 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 and he had that right. <laughs> How old were you when your father said you were a shit disturber? Thirteen. 
Nice. Did you had you done anything in particular? Yeah, the whole rebellious thing tends to play well for journalists. Um, can you... How did it change your process being watched, or did it? Uh, no, it didn't at all. I mean, I, I think this, this... Well, first of all, when I agreed to do it, I said to Michael, I am not going to direct this film. I am not going to have anything to do with it. It's your film. You do what you want. Do what you want. You can have complete access to me. But I am not going to suggest, criticize, or anything. And I think I succeeded pretty well in staying right out of it. But the other good part of it was that I was shooting my own film while he was shooting me. Shooting a very sort of here in Delo, like, and I was so focused on what I was doing, I wasn't aware a lot of the time that where, where his camera was, whether they were rolling or not. Are you hearing me all right? Perfectly. Oh, good. Because there's some beeping going on my end, but I can stand the beating. Yeah, I'm not yeah. hearing any beeping okay. at all. Oh, if you're hearing me clearly, carry on. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, and that's why I think the film is, like, you know, is, is, a, is a good one because it's an honest film. And uh, it's honest about me and about what it's like shoot a documentary. And only, you know, I was never asked to do things for the cameras or anything else, and actually forgot about the camera most of the time. Once in a while they caught me at a time. I was embarrassed that they caught me, but that it being. Oh, hang on, I've, I've lost you for a second now. Are you still there? Okay, I'm still here. Are oh, you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Can, can you talk okay. about how long have you been working with Michael? Like what? Uh, we started uh, back in the late eighties, and he shot some of, as I say, some of my more difficult uh, films and difficult adventures. He went to Africa with me to Uganda when we were doing a film about. AIDS in Africa just at the beginning of the pandemic in Africa. Uh, he went to Sarajevo with me during the war when we shot Romeo and Juliet in Sarajevo. Uh, he shot some of my American films in some nasty slums in America. So he's He's been around a few tough blocks with me. Wow. Um, in terms of some of those stories, like how would you have, how did you find Romeo and Juliet in Sarajevo? Did you go to Sarajevo because of you'd heard of them? Or did you go to Sarajevo and... No, it was, a, it was, it was front page news around the world when they were shot and when they tied in each other's arms to her pictures. And so I picked up the Globe and Mail one day and there, there was this incredible picture, an incredible story. And uh, I had just been commissioned by PBS Frontline. To, they wanted me to do a film on the Bosnian War because they said, Nobody in America understands what the hell is going on, who the Serbs are, who the Muslims are. And then there's these Croats. And so can you do a film that could make it understandable to an American audience? So, um, so this story just hit the headlines, as I say. And I thought, well, 
her smoke's good. Um, but I wasn't the only guy who thought it was a, you know, yeah. a story that was worth making a film about or writing a book about or whatever. Uh, but fortunately, I, uh, I did some homework and I, just, I mean, then Sherry Eagle was ranked by journalists organizations as the most dangerous place on her. Wow, okay. And so I, you know, before I went in there, I said, Who, who's the best fixer in Sarajevo? I talked to a number of people, cameramen and whatever, who had been in there working in Sarajevo. They all said, but that guy is a guy called Shorty. Uh, but he's no longer, he just escaped and he's now a refugee in Los Angeles. And so I got his phone number and phone up and said, you know, <laughs> and he said, well, you know, everybody's been after that story. I don't know. But I mean, he himself was a Serb married to a Muslim woman. And so he totally identified with the story, knew some of the principles. And uh, so on a wing and a prayer, we went off to Sarajevo. And uh, as I say, there had been, well, not to exaggerate, but a whole parade of media people who had gone to knock on the gate because the Muslim family, the father and the mother, lived in this compound. And... Everybody had been turned away at the gate, and we went and knocked on the gate, and the Muslim father came to the gate and looked out, and he said, oh, you're Zorky, you're a... and he had been a big radio show uh, drive home host before the war, so that got us through the gate. <laughs> well, I, uh, we... Yeah, he spent a week. My fixer, Zorn, is his actual proper name. Zorn and the Muslim father, every day we'd show up. They'd sit opposite each other, smoking copiously and talking in cerebral creation. I didn't understand a word, but I sat there watching the two of them. And every night I'd get a report on what what had gone down and what what the father was concerned about. And then I would tell Zerky, well, you could tell him, you know, I promise that we'll do this and that and whatever. And finally, after a week of this, he agreed to do the film. And that's how I got it. <laughs> Can you talk I didn't about get it. <laughs> my, my now, he's now one of my best friends. He got the story, and I was lucky enough to shoot it. Can you talk about making the switch from print to documentary, like how and why that happened? Uh, yeah, I just sold out. I was perfectly happy. <laughs> I would, have, would have stayed there. I got the Globe, I got the Globe and Mail. But the CBC came along at a time when they were they thought they wanted to improve the quality of journalism. So they offered me and a couple of other print reporters. In my case, they offered me two and a half times what I was making at the, at the Globe and Mail. So I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll take the money. And I, I was quite honest. I had never been near a camera. I knew nothing about television or film or anything. And he said, don't worry. We'll train you, we'll teach you. And that's so that's cool. We started. What year was that? 1973. <laughs> that's so cool. So I'm curious, you never decided on one of these stories, I'm going to write a book as well as do the documentary? No, I, um, I you know, it was a difficult adjustment actually. Because instead of me and my notepad, 
you know, and now I had, you know, a sound man and a cameraman and a producer, you know, all the, you know, and so, you know, I had to learn to work with a team and uh, be in charge of a team because it's a team sport, not an individual sport, you know, so that was a huge adjustment for me. Okay. Um, what was, was that sort of the hardest part was working with the team? Like the hardest? Well, making the adjustment to working, you know, and I suddenly had all this equipment and told and we knew me. Yeah, so it was, yeah. There were many days when I thought, oh, I wish I was back in print, but, uh, you know, I began to enjoy it. And, uh, here I am. What's your favorite part of making a movie? My favorite part of it? Yeah. Is now, is now working with uh, my editor and my cameraman and my son. <laughs> you know, the personal uh, relationships and which are very close that you develop. And uh, I enjoy that a great deal. And I so much enjoy the adventure of documentary filmmaking and, you know, the people I get to meet, many of whom, you know, become friends of mine afterwards. And uh, I get to see, you know, worlds and parts of the world that 99% of the world, of the population never gets to see, you know, I get to meet the poorest people on earth and the richest people on earth and everything in between. Now, when you choose a social issue, when you choose something that inspires you, what are you hoping the documentary will do and what, what have you sort of seen your documentaries do? Well, I hope that they certainly at least change people's attitudes in a lot of instances. I mean, you know, like, you know, the film I won an Academy Award for when I, you know, made the film, Missing Children were on the backs of, you know, milk cartons and on the side of trucks and there weren't any organizations of, for families and, the, you know, the system really didn't care about missing kids. And I think, you know, it's, that film, you know, was, was used in police academies and, you know, universities. And, you know, I think it changed things a great deal. And that's just, you know, one example. Can you, are there any other things that kind of come to mind about what your films have accomplished? Because that's pretty cool. Um... Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry? Teaching. Teaching. Like teaching. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, my wife was talking to me. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, um, you know, uh, I did a film uh, for HBO about a treatment program for sex criminals. And I you know, who are, you know, <laughs> universally unpopular yep. with everybody. Uh, everybody hates the, the child molester and the rapist and whatever. But as a result of the film, other states decided that the approach that was taken in Oregon towards sex criminals was a good one in that, you know, yes, the sex criminals should be punished and must do their time in prison, which is the rules, rules of the game in Oregon. But before they're released, and if they want to, they can go into a treatment program. And the idea that it's better to at least try to treat them and try to make them, you know, more responsible law-abiding than it is just to put them back on the streets as they reoffend at a very, very high rate. Yeah. 
off and become worse sex criminals than they were when they went in, you know. So that was another example. That's very cool. I mean, I... <laughs> I want to be clear, I'm not in favor of sex criminals. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but you know, actually I was, it was done at, at the Oregon State Mental, Mental Hospital, you know, walked a ward, and I spent, you know, about four months in this ward with these guys. And if you do that, you have that kind of experience. You know, I mean, even in the worst cases, there's still a humanity underneath it all, especially with those that, as these people were, who were trying to overcome, you know, their problems. Wow. How long have you and your wife been together? Uh, 13 years. Does she work on your movies at all? No, she's smarter than that. She's a, she's a nurse. Okay. And runs her catering business. How long were you in Vancouver? How long were you in Vancouver before you you decided to hit the road? Uh, I've been there uh, eighteen years. Okay. Now, are yeah. you? I'm assuming you're not coming out to Whistler for this. I am. You I you am. are. Yeah. You're flying in yeah. from Europe for Worcester. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's all well, I wanted to support Michael and support the film, but also uh, I would probably have not done it if it weren't for the Worcester Film Festival, who have been very, very kind and generous to me over the years. Uh, the first film they ever showed at the inaugural of the Whistler Film Festival was Ski Bums, a film that I made about local Whistler Ski Bums. Okay. And, and on the 10th anniversary, they again ran Ski Bums as part of their celebration. And uh, also, they gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award, so I'm happy to show up any time they want me. Wow. That's, I mean, I love that festival. And also, I, I was a ski bum for 10 years up there, so, you know, it's sort of my second hometown. Okay. That's very cool. Um, yeah. What advice would, oh, hang on, have you, you've seen the movie, I'm assuming. It sounded like you've seen it. I have. I have seen it. Yes. What was what was that like watching yourself on what watching yourself and watching that movie? Uh, really difficult. I could only watch it with my wife because uh, I wanted desperately to know what she thought of it. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, there were parts where I was a little, <laughs> yeah, wondering, you know what it will do to me or my reputation but I think my reputation is bad enough <laughs> I surprise anybody and bottom line as they say I was glad and relieved that I thought it was an honest film and that it captured the reality of making documentaries on limited budgets and all the problems that are entailed with working in the vineyards of the business, you know? Okay. Now, do you... What... Have you, have you seen the film or not? No, the link that you that I was sent was dead, so it was very frustrating. No, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, because... Should I ask Michael, should I ask Michael to send you another link to it? Yeah, too bad. because I was planning, I sort of set aside two hours to watch it yesterday before talking to you and went and turned it on. Oh. It was like dead link. What a shame. I'd really guess too bad. Um, I can't do anything because I don't have 
you know, he asked to send me a, a link on Vimeo that only works for, I think, 48 hours. So, you know, if I could, I would say a thing, but you should get hold of him because I, I'm sure he'd be horrified to learn that you were able to see it. I'll bug I'll bug Helen today. It's just there was no way I was going to have it in time to check it out to, once I missed that yeah, window. Sure. Um, That's fine. So, um, what advice would you give to people who want to make docs or ha- since uh, for Real West I always try and get something educational out of people. So, what advice would you give to to aspiring doc filmmakers or existing doc filmmakers? Mm. Well, I taught, uh, I've taught at different film schools at Berkeley, uh, at Berkeley for a couple of semesters at UBC for four years. And I was always being asked that question by students. And aside from saying, don't, <laughs> I, uh, no, I mean, I really would advise them that well, to be honest with it, you know, if you're prepared not to make very much money and spend half your life dealing with bureaucrats, then the other half will be tremendously rewarding in personal terms. And, uh, you know, you'll have, you'll have a hell of a good time and you may be able to do some social good too. That's very cool. Um, nice. Do you do you still plan to teach? Do you have do you have another documentary in the works? Are you up to anything new that I should be mentioning? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I'm working on something. I've been researching and developing something. Uh, I'm currently, but I'm currently looking for a producer and uh, a broadcaster, but first a producer. So I'm hoping I might find back in, um, back for the festival and back in Vancouver for a couple of weeks. If you know any Vancouver producers who are available, send them along, please. Wow. that That's both cool and... Like I said, there's a part of me that that sort of feels like at this point, if you've got an idea, somebody would just trust you with it. Mm. You know, I need a producer to do all the mountains of paperwork and all that stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, every time... Business has never been a strong point for me, so... No, the it kind of boggles my mind seeing what has to go into this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I, I don't want to get started on it, but it's, you know, it's overrun with bureaucrats and, it, you know. Okay. Have you, was it different working in the States? Like what was... I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, Americans are smart businessmen and they make decisions quickly and they have money. So, you know, I worked for PBS for a number of years and, you know, life was easy. I mean, I'd go and have lunch with the exec and senior producer. They'd either say yes or no to a, an idea and then... You know, getting the money together and whatever was easy, you know. And you say, well, why didn't you stay there? Well, because I wanted, because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do paid. So Canada, you know, to be fair, was a place where I could do, you know, ski bombs. Nobody was going to let me do ski bombs in, in the state. You know? That's just one example. I wanted to do a, a, a series. I couldn't 
you know, I could have done the same thing I was doing, but I would do it year after year. I did make different sounds and experiment a bit more. And, you know, I could do that again. Okay. Um, any I other... couldn't make nearly as much money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, I would... You know, for most Canadians, if they won an Oscar, they kind of, a lot of people would be gone from Canada after that. That's all. Yeah, well, um, you know, I still have strong roots in Canada. And uh, even when I work in the States, I mean, when I work for HBO, I hate to fly to New York in the first flight out of, out of, Pearson and I'd be back on the last flight at night. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, any other good stuff I should know? No, I probably have bored you sufficiently. Oh, no, not at all. You've you've really made some amazing movies, so it's very cool getting to talk to you. So. Well, I've enjoyed it myself. So. And if you have any other questions when you get to writing the piece or any problems, just, you've got my number now, so just give me a call. Perfect. And Thank you. I'll be in, in range. Thank you okay. so much. I'm really looking forward to meeting you at Whistler. Okay, so me tell you're going to be in Whistler. Right? Absolutely. Oh, good. Okay, you know, I'll look forward to seeing you then. All right. Take care. You Th can buy me a drink. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. We'll Very see. cool. Take care. Bye. Bye.